Thank you so much uh, for that uh, incredibly uh, informative uh, presentation. Both of you have really uh, put together um, a, a very deep and raw view of what is going on uh, at the ground level. And it's very important to be able to cover that in order to get a sense of what the problem is and then blowing it up in terms of what it means and uh, what that experience spells in terms of impl implications. So now we have time for uh, Q&A uh, for our uh, many uh, participants here. And so I have one question that has come up, which I will ask you. Um, I think this is uh, primar primarily for you, Julia. Uh, this person asks, has the professor ever researched the scarcity of comprehensive dental insurance for the wide swath of the rank and file of workers she's studying? I haven't, but geez, shouldn't we all have dental? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, it, this isn't your question at all. Um, but one of the, or you know, I, I I can say kind of uh, pretty pretty confidently, um, that very very few and probably nearly none of the workers that I have interviewed in either of these projects had insur employer provided insurance, <laughs> um, because they were all less than part time or barely part time. Um, and for the domestic workers, uh, I would say. 99% of them uh, were either providing their own insurance or were uninsured or were on a partner's insurance, right? Um, so, you know, when we think about the domestic care work industry is it's largely informal um, and very often um, folks were relying on partners with more traditional jobs um, to be insured or were going uninsured. Um, and, you know, going on those marketplaces is expensive. And so few domestic workers were able to do that, um, but uh, not many. Um, one of the things that did surprise me in this research and something that I've started advocating um, for after the publication of the book is that very few of these um, employers who are, you know, and Tracy, maybe you can speak to this too in your, in your context, that um, a lot of what I saw in my field work was that uh, you know, these precarious workers were, <laughs> precarious workers were um, uh, basically required to have operational smartphones in order to get their work, in order to do their schedules, in order to be in touch with their managers, in order to be in touch with their shift mates, in order to uh, research prices for, you know, people in the store. It was just kind of assumed that workers would have their phones with them or have data plans and be able to afford all these things. And it was not subsidized by their employer in any way. Um, the employer was not absorbing any of those costs. Um, and so after the kind of, after the research and the publication of the book, that's something I've come out on a little bit more is to be like, this is something that employers could do, right? To kind of acknowledge the fact that um, these things are playing such a key role um, in, in workers' everyday lives. Yeah. And, you know, if there was more of an understanding by uh, employers or clients, depending on whether they're formally employed or not, that um, keeping people healthy uh, through uh, various uh, methods of stabilizing work schedules, providing benefits, providing sick leave, and so on, actually translated in better productivity and fewer costs. And in the case that Tracy's been making is, um, you know, less theft, less less uh, mistakes happening uh, in the work site so that people, I mean, uh, employees actually want to stay. And so you don't have that turnover and you don't have uh, so much um, wasted time and effort uh, uh, with the revolving door of em employment, at least in your situation. So uh, what will get through? Let me just ask a bold question, which is, Given what both of you have been studying, and it has been, um, you know, researched uh, very thoroughly about the problems that are connected with low wage work and uh, tech based uh, types of work and te tech surveillance, 
give us some hope here. We're, we're going to spend tomorrow hopefully uh, getting to uh, a more positive territory, but from all of your experience there, what are you thinking that there's at least one thing that you think could really improve things? Any takers? <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> So in terms of improving things, I did mention um, the hashtag put in a ticket movement. And I also mentioned Step Up Louisiana and their work with dollar stores. And there's also a organization that formed Dollar Store Workers United. So workers themselves are taking the initiative, even though they're isolated in the stores, to do some collective grassroots organizing and have their voices heard. So I have hope and a feeling of excitement for the future um, of the potential of those uh, worker uprisings and what may come of them, hopefully. Uh, and they are, for example, Step Up Louisiana is um, has a strong component of racial justice as well. And so um, my hope is that these workers' voices are heard and um, that I can partner with them and assist them however I can to get some changes made. And I think we've seen that a bit, at least in terms of um, Fight for 15 has had some success over the past few years. Well, that gives us something to go on. Um, Julia, do you have anything you want to add? Any Anything to throw your hat in the ring here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I would agree with Tracy. Um, I think uh, you know, when I what I see the most powerful changes emanating from pushing back on, um, you know, whether it's surveillance inside of people's homes or, you know, surveillance online, the kind of um, worker organizing that I think has been the most uh, impactful has been, in my case, from the domestic workers themselves, right? Domestic workers have been organized <laughs> for a long time um, and they have their own um, lots of different domestic worker organizations in the United States. They have incredible legacies of, you know, um, you know, participation in the civil rights movement, of joining forces with um, their employers in some case to push for, um, you know, better regulation for their uh, improvement in their working conditions, and also with workers across sectors um, to push for, you know, the recognition of the rights of workers of color, for example, um, through, you know, the civil rights movement and in, in many other, um, in many other sectors. So, um, in just in Philadelphia, for example, where I am, um, there was the passage of a domestic workers bill of rights for our city that was spearheaded by the National Domestic Workers Alliance and many others, um, a few other organizations in this city. Um, and it includes a provision about the responsibility of um, uh, job intermediaries. So that could be uh, nanny agencies or domestic work agencies, but it also includes platforms that it act is actually the responsibility of these intermediaries to inform uh, clients, to inform parents and other people who are looking for um, care workers or domestic workers of their responsibilities to respect domestic workers' um, rights within their households um, and not putting that burden of education onto the domestic workers themselves. And so, you know, when I think about the kind of organizing that I'm excited about, it's from these longer standing organizations um, that have been doing this for a while. They have their constituencies, they know what they're doing. It's just a matter of um, you know, adding in um, these new concerns. Um, and of course, this shouldn't just be up to worker organizing, right? There should be some more aggressive um, uh, you know, reform and implementation of, of existing law from our state agencies that are responsible for these things. Um, when I think about things regarding the consumer web, right, we can think about the FTC and the FCC, which have, um, you know, jurisdiction over these issues as far as privacy protection and um, a lot of the kind of things that we don't think about as worker protections, but that are worker protections when we think about online job searching and doing work online, right? Um, and, you know, it's just a matter of political will um, or for actually using the things that we already have. <laughs> yeah, it seems like we're, we're still stuck with organizing from the bottom up um, and, you know, t trying to raise up with these other organizations that have have, have had a long history of uh, protecting worker rights and, and fighting for workers that it does seem to be uh, a natural next step is to is to get under that umbrella. 
we still have a gap between you know those organizing organizations and what um in, entrepreneurs and employers and uh, clients seem to perceive as to what benefits them most. So it's it's um, it's really a, a problem. So uh, we had a couple of other questions here and they have actually dropped off. So um, let me ask one more question and, and then we'll move to our closing argument, uh, closing arguments, yeah, closing remarks. Uh, and, and that is, what if the labor force grows substantially more in the temporary worker, gig worker, independent contractor direction? Do you think there could be uh, any uh, good leverage that comes from that? Or do you see it as something that's that makes uh, a good wage and good living and good protection more precarious. If that's the way it's if that's the way it's going, do you think it'll go better, or do you think it will just accentuate uh, what's not going very well now? I know big questions. End of day. Well, Why not? You know, I um <laughs> Tracy, you know, I, I you you could jump in on this too because I heard, you know, you reference Aaron Hatton in that in that presentation and I was just like over here clapping silently. Um, you know, Aaron and other kind of um historians of precarious work would say that these forms of work were designed intentionally to undercut worker power, right? So they were, um, you know, th that was the point of, you know, creating this form of work in the first place. Um, and, you know, of course, we've seen, as I mentioned in my presentation, we've seen these forms of precarious work. It wasn't new in the 1970s. It's not new now. Um, we saw it for, you know, uh, workers of color, for women, um, certainly in domestic work, right? The leader of the domestic workers or the National Domestic Workers Alliance has said domestic workers are the original gig workers, right? We should be looking at them for lessons for how we're dealing with this for everybody now, right? Um, although, you know, maybe we're at a moment where, you know, we're seeing some more aggressive legislation and regulation against uh, misclassification, question mark you know it seems like there's a step forward and there's two steps back and there's a few steps forward and a step back in the united states although we're seeing um certainly steps in the right direction um abroad especially in europe um about misclassification um and so i don't know uh i think the future is going to be patchy and unclear uh i think we're personally i think we're going to see misclassification and independent contracting get shoved down um, in terms of lower and lower status work is going to be more and more affected by it. And we're going to see, you know, workers with, um, with uh, you know, more power um, in the labor market are going to be able to fight um, those things uh, and going to be able to fight those issues. Um, we've seen that with uh, ride hail drivers, right? Ride hail drivers have been um, the most successful at fighting their misclassification, although um, it's still relatively patchy. Um, yeah, I would say that's, those are my thoughts on that. I'm not sure it's necessarily going to get better because of the status, <laughs> um, but we might get better at fighting it. Um, I would like to take it one step further because Dollar General has been implementing self-checkout kiosks. And so I think technology is being used as a way to, uh, subvert and avoid a lot of these issues that come up with employees by removing them and having the self-checkout kiosks um, monitoring the customers as they check out and um, it, making dollar store workers responsible for overseeing the kiosks like has happened at Walmart. Um, and I'm wondering if it's going to go to the point of like the Amazon store where you don't even really need workers on the store floor to be assisting with shopping and maybe they'll just be contingent stalkers on the store floor. And uh, I think I'm a little concerned actually for how these self-checkout kiosks that are at, you know, McDonald's and Walmart and <laughs> um, Dollar General impact workers. However, I've seen a lot of them broken down and this put in a ticket movement 
has also um, pointed out that if the organization, if the corporation is not willing to keep these machines and technology up to date and working properly, then they do need the workers. <laughs> um, because I've seen stores where they aren't working properly, or a lot of the uh, a lot of the customers um, don't have um, credit cards or debit cards, and the machine is broken down and only accepting debit and credit. So they need the store workers there to do the cash transactions. Um, so that's my answer, I suppose. Can, Christina, do we have time for me to ask Tracy? Yep. Uh, absolutely, we do. <laughs> um, just off of that point, um, Tracy, one of the questions that I had for you, one of the reasons I think your work is so um, fascinating is, you know, in thinking about one of the things that struck me about the Amazon store, right, this like cashierless store, is that where they piloted these stores were in like very high income areas, right? And they're these clientele that have never uh, heard shrinkage. They don't know what shrinkage <laughs> is. They're, they're used to being trusted walking around a store. And while you might feel weird to walk out of a store without paying for something, they're kind of comfortable with it, right? They've like never been suspicion, you know, been the cause of suspicion before. And I'm wondering about, um, you know, one of the things that strikes me from your presentation is the criminalization of customers and workers, right? That like everybody's suspicious um, in this work site. Um, and I'm wondering about how criminalization, like whether you see what, what you have to say about the use of technology in terms of criminalization um, between workers and customers, between managers and workers and customers, right? Um, that it just seems to be operating in all directions. Um, uh, I'm just really curious to hear you talk more about the use of technology or not um, to, to do this um, in these stores. Well, um, I just keep thinking it's the criminalization of the poor and yet another form with the use of technological apparatuses to do so. And, you know, this, the Amazon stores and higher end stores, like maybe Whole Foods, or I'm trying to think of, you know, stores that service more middle class or even upper middle class customers. Um, there's, there's a big difference between the customer base there and the sentiments between cor the corporation and their customers there. Whereas for lower end retail, like dollar stores, um, yeah, I, it's it's um, the the policing of the poor and the profit margin is so small for dollar stores as well because a lot of their products are coming from you know um, China in particular other nations um, where they're underpaying their workers to even produce these things so it's really like a profiting off of the poor under intense technological surveillance. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I do see like a split and a difference that almost reflects that split between um, the growing gap of economic inequality between the stores that service those more affluent customers and those that service those on the you know poorer end and that growing gap of uh, economic inequality. Yeah, there's probably a relationship between the margin that a business uh, is able to extract from their sales and uh, the lack of infrastructure uh, that the company puts in place so that uh, both customers and employees or even um, independent contractors or uh, gig workers can actually uh, excel with and um, so there, you know, a major problem here is the lack of funding and uh, the lack of knowledge of how to build an infrastructure to actually support success on the part of uh, the individuals who make the money for them. So um, great talks. Thank you so much.